All right, so finally, um, my last story is actually kind of a long one. So um, I kind of sped through these, these first um, several ones. But uh, this is also um, the one that um, I think is, is probably um, the more interesting of everything that, um, that I'll be talking about tonight. And so there were a bunch of um, headlines that appeared, um, for instance, at um, space.com. The universe is expanding faster than we thought, Hubble data suggests. Um, here's another headline from another astronomy website. Um, another one, Cosmos, um, says, new physics needed to explain the universe, study finds. And then even Newsweek um, had um, a headline about this. And what they were all talking about is this new paper um, that, was, um, b that has been accepted um, into a journal, meaning it's been reviewed uh, by um, ref independent referees and they didn't find anything wrong with it. And so uh, it means um, this will be published. And what I want to do is um, talk in detail about what these findings are. And in order to do that, what we have to do is talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about the Big Bang and when we talk about the expanding universe. And so oftentimes um, when you hear the term the Big Bang, you think, oh, it must be like an explosion. Like if a bomb um, went off in this room and you have debris flying off in every single direction. Well, it turns out that um, that is the, um, it's not you know, possibly the worst um, analogy, but it's actually, a, um, it's still a very, very wrong analogy. So the important thing that you need to think about is the Big Bang is not an explosion. And the reason why is that um, when the universe expands because of the Big Bang, what is expanding is not just um, the galaxies, but it's actually space-time itself. So Einstein showed us that um, space, the three dimensions of space that um, we all know, like, um, so when you, when you talk about an object, you can talk about its length, its width, and its height, given three dimensions. But Einstein realized that um, the three dimensions of space cannot be separated from the single dimension of time. So he um, came up with this idea that you, have, you cannot disentangle um, those four, and so you have to talk about space-time. And when Einstein worked on his theories of rel relativity, he realized that he could um, apply them to the universe at large and show that um, the universe um, could end up um, not being static, and so um, it can actually ex expand. And when it expands, what happens is space-time itself, represented by that grid, um, is actually expanding. Um, and so galaxies are actually being carried along by this expansion. And galaxies themselves have enough gravity that they um, basically hold together. And so um, the stars inside a galaxy don't participate in the expansion. They're just carried along with the galaxy. But if galaxies are sufficiently far away and enough that they're not um, bound by gravity between them, then they will be carried along by the expanding space time. All right, so here is another um, sort of way to see this. And we can imagine ourselves um, being on, let's say, a galaxy um, right in the center of this diagram. And what will happen is that over t um, time, um, all the galaxies will um, be farther apart. Um, and again, this is because space-time is expanding. And if we overlay um, the, those two sets of dots, what we find is here we are at the central galaxy. We find that galaxies one unit away, whatever distance this is, um, they've expanded by a certain amount. But when we look at a galaxy that's even further away, twice um, this unit, you can see that their separation is even larger, and then the separation over here is larger still. So basically, um, when space-time expands uniformly throughout the universe, um, it appears as if galaxies that are further away are actually accelerating uh, more than the galaxies close to us. And this is entirely um, a product of the fact that um, the space-time is expanding uniformly. And it doesn't um, have to be um, centered on this galaxy here. If we center on this galaxy over here, um, we find the same thing. So an observer at a galaxy here will also find galaxies accelerating the further away you go. And so um, one of the big goals of astronomers is um, to try and figure out what that acceleration is because that tells us how um, quickly the universe is expanding. And that tells us, um, can also tell us um, the, the origins of the universe, how long ago the Big Bang occurred, and then the fate of the universe, what will happen to the universe 
uh, many billions, hundreds of billions, uh, perhaps trillions of years from now. And one of the ways that they, um, astronomers can do this is they use something known as standard candles. And this is a way that we can measure um, distances to uh, very far galaxies. Obviously, we can't go and lay down a tape measure to um, distant galaxies. And so what we do is we find objects that we think are um, of uniform brightness. So in this case, you know, if you have a candle that's nearby and you know that there's another candle that's exactly the same as it, um, but it's uh, fainter, then um, that tells you there's a, uh, a distance a difference between the, uh, the bright candle and the far candle. And then in reality, things get more complicated because um, we can have cosmic dust that can obscure part of the, star, um, the starlight or the light from galaxies. And so, uh, but the, you know, this for the most part is what astronomers are trying to calibrate when they're measuring um, distances to distant galaxies, trying to figure out what these um, standard candles are and then also what um, effects might um, change their appearance um, throughout the universe. And so the, the first standard candle that was discovered is a type of star known as a Cepheid variable. And these stars are ones that actually pulsate. And when they pro pulsate, they um, get brighter and then they get dimmer over time. And um, these um, stars um, typically are, are of the order about 100,000 times um, the luminosity of our sun. So that means that they can be seen at really um, far distances. And that also makes them a good standard candle because you don't want to use a candle that's really dim, um, in which case you can only observe really nearby galaxies. And Henrietta Leavitt, at the end of the 19th century, um, observed uh, many Cepheid variables in a nearby um, satellite galaxy to her own Milky Way, the large Magellanic Cloud. And she be, um, was the first person to realize that there was actually a, um, a luminosity um, period relationship for these Cepheids. And so here is the, um, the very first um, Cepheid variable that was um, discovered, Delta Cephei. And what we're seeing is a plot showing the change in the brightness of that star as it pulsates. And what you can um, also notice is that this pulsation occurs over a period of about 5.4 or five and a half days. So every five and a half days or so, the star gets brighter, dims, and then gets back to its maximum brightness. But what um, Henry Levitt discovered was that because she observed um, all these Cepheids in the large Magellanic Cloud, which was um, rough, so that she could assume that they were all roughly at the same distance, she found that um, depending on the periodicity of um, how much this, um, the, the brightness was, was changing, um, she, she actually found a, um, a relationship between the brightness of the, the intrinsic brightness of the star and how quickly um, it would oscillate. And so what she found was that the, um, the longer the period, as you go from a few days to up to several months, um, that's 100 days, you find the luminosity of these stars, um, going, their base luminosity going from 1,000 times that of the sun up to about 30,000 times. And so um, you know, this was really important because um, we can actually observe these types of stars in other nearby galaxies and use those as a standard candle to basically tell us how far these much more distant galaxies are. So um, this is something that um, Edwin Hubble um, did. And in his um, work in the, um, the 1920s, um, and so he, um, along with his collaborators, um, w were um, mapping um, in, um, other galaxies and finding Cepheid variables in them and measuring their periods and then figuring out how bright they should be. And then by actually measuring how faint they actually appeared, um, work out how far away they must be. And so these distances here are in megaparsecs or, or millions of parsecs. So to get to light years, you have to multiply by three. So this is from zero to about um, six or seven million light years. And here we're going out to almost 100 million light years. So you know, th these are um, getting to be really distant um, galaxies. But um, as far as the cosmic distance um, scale goes, this is still um, pretty um, small. Th these are all relatively nearby galaxies. Now, um, to get to much more distant galaxies, you have to go to a different type of standard candle. And um, this is the type 1a supernova. And these supernovae occur 
um, in binary star systems. This, um, if you have a binary star up here and one of them turns into a white dwarf before the other, what can happen is that uh, the white dwarf draws in gas um, from the outer envelope of its companion star. And once it builds up enough gas, um, that uh, material can go off in a supernova. And um, this, um, we think theoretically, should be a standard candle just because there's a limit to how much gas you can pile up before the supernova occurs. And so um, not only is there um, a certain amount of mass that goes into the supernova, but um, we also think that there's a certain amount of light that gets produced um, from the supernova. And so this is another reason why it's a good standard candle. In this case, um, these supernova are, are of the order about a billion times the brightness of our sun. So they're really good for looking out, out to even more distant galaxies. And so basically what astronomers have done is they've used one method to sort of bootstrap themselves to a more distant method. And, and what um, they're looking for are basically two numbers. And this is um, true up um, through the 90s. And one of them is what we call Hubble's constant. So um, remember when we were looking at the accelerating galaxies, the further away the galaxy, the more accelerated away from you. Well, the Hubble's constant is basically a measure of that acceleration. So it basically tells you how quickly the universe is accelerating. And if the universe was accelerating kind of slowly, that means it took a long time for it to expand to its present size. But if it accelerated really quickly or is accelerating quickly, that means the universe um, isn't as old because it um, accelerated um, quickly to get its, to its present size. The other um, number that cosmologists, astronomers are interested in, in um, is the deceleration um, parameter. And what this is, is we know the universe is, um, is expanding, but we expect that over time it should decelerate or slow down. And that's just because all the matter and energy in the universe can cause, can um, slow down the expansion. And if, there, if the deceleration parameter is strong enough, it will actually cause the universe to recollapse back on itself so that it will grow to a maximum size and then um, collapse in, in, in a big crunch. But if the deceleration parameter isn't strong enough, then um, you might expect the universe to continue to slow, but it will never slow to a halt and, and recollapse. All right, so here um, is what the state of um, our knowledge about the expanding universe was um, back in the mid-1990s. And so remember um, those Hubble um, plots um, from a few slides back, we were looking out to hundreds of millions, you know, about 100 million light years. Well, by the 1990s, we, um, this is about um, 140 million light years, 0.14 billion. So we're, we're um, well over a billion um, light years away in space. Um, but, um, and this was uh, by measuring um, that bootstrap I was talking about, using the Cepheids to um, get us out to um, the supernovas. And then um, in 1998, they were able to um, get it out to even further, so out to close to 8 billion light years of light travel time. And what was really interesting is that um, at this distance, they were actually finding evidence that um, the universe was accelerating. So there wasn't any deceleration at all. And this is the, um, the discovery of dark energy that I talked about um, way at the beginning of um, our talk. Um, so there is this mysterious force that's causing the universe to expand faster um, instead of slowing down. And in 1998, two different groups actually um, came up um, with observations that showed the existence of this dark energy, this very mysterious dark energy. And Adam Rees um, is one of the leaders of one of these teams and he actually gave an excellent um, talk about his results at a conference that I was at a couple months ago. So I've uh, basically stolen his slides for um, the, the remainder of this talk. So, and then um, as we um, go from the, um, the late 90s to today, we've had better and better um, ground-based surveys um, from really large telescopes on the ground and from the Hubble Space Telescope. And so um, we've really filled in, so you can see how sparse the supernova detections are. Uh, but over time, you can see that lots, um, there's lots and lots of supernova that have been used to really nail down 
the, um, the, our knowledge about how quickly the, um, the universe is expanding. And as we fill in these gaps, we find that dark energy refuses to go away. So it's, um, dark energy appears to be real um, just because um, our data, as, as it gets better and better, um, that dark energy signal is still there. So we're finally um, able to now talk about what um, Adam Reese's group um, has done, and which was the topic of all these press re um, stories that we saw um, about 10, 15 minutes ago. And so basically what they um, want to do is try and reanalyze or redo a lot of the work that's been done over the last century um, to, um, to nail down this cosmic um, distance ladder. And so um, there are three um, different steps in doing this. Um, one is they want to remeasure distances to um, the nearby Cepheid variables. And um, when, <clears throat> you know, we, I mentioned that we we're able to um, get a period luminosity relation for the Cepheids, but you still need to figure out exactly how far the, the Cepheids are. And one way you can do that is to use the parallax method. And that's actually a geometric method. And so that actually gives you an exact distance. And it turns out that um, before um, our parallax uh, methods um, allowed us to only measure um, a handful of Cepheids that were close um, to um, our sun, just because um, the uncertainties were so large. But as you'll see, they came up with a new method that expanded um, how many more Cepheids you can measure with parallax. Next, um, they redid um, their relationship between Cepheids and the, um, the supernova type 1As um, to try and nail down um, that bootstrap when you go from um, Cepheids to um, supernovas. And then finally, um, they also um, consistently um, nailed down um, how um, going from measuring supernova to the expansion of the universe um, could be more uh, precise. So um, let's just talk about each of these uh, methods. So um, par par parallax is basically the effect um, of the, um, the motion of the Earth around the sun. So because the um, Earth is orbiting the sun, when we look out into um, a distant star or a galaxy, we're seeing that distant object from two slightly different directions. So if you imagine the Earth orbiting the sun like this, we're going to look at, um, we're going to observe when the Earth is um, at this point in its orbit and also at this point in its orbit. And so you can imagine that if um, you were looking at an object that was close by, it would actually shift um, with respect to more distant background objects. And you can easily do that if you stick out your thumb, and you probably played with this yourself, but you, know, you stick out your thumb and you switch your eyes and you can see your thumb actually shift up against the more uh, distant wall. So when we look at Proxima Centauri, for instance, the, uh, the star that we talked about earlier, you can actually, um, we can actually observe over time how Proxima Centauri has actually shifted against the sky relative to the background stars. And again, this is all due to the fact that the Earth is in orbit around the sun. Now, unfortunately, as you go to more and more distant stars, this method becomes more and more difficult to do just because the, um, the amount of shift that you see sh shrinks and it becomes harder and harder to pick out that, sh that shift due to um, the Earth's motion. And so if you were um, trying to do a traditional parallax using, let's say, the Hubble um, Space Telescope and using the best instruments on Hubble, um, you're in space so you don't have to worry about the blurriness of the atmosphere. And it turns out that the best uh, precision that you can get by, um, if you were trying to measure a star and it appear somewhere in the detector here and at a certain time later it had shifted because of parallax, the best you can do by fitting, um, doing a mathematical fit to the stellar profiles for instance, might get you down to uh, a hundredth of a pixel on Hubble's best um, instrument. But what uh, Reese and his group did um, for this new survey was um, they did something clever. Instead of looking at the object in space and being, um, pointing Hubble um, and keeping it locked, what they did was they let Hubble drift. And so what happened um, was that as a drift, the star, instead of showing um, a, a straight profile or a single profile, it actually left um, these lines. And so this is what it looks like on the, de the detector. And so instead of trying to measure 
two uh, points as profiles, you're um, now trying to measure the distance between these two lines, which um, gives you a lot more information than um, from those two points from before. And so as a result, depending on the number of samples, meaning the number of pixels that you're shifting over, um, you can increase the precision by uh, the square root of the um, number of n um, samples. And so um, you can get down to um, tens to hundreds of times more accuracy um, using this method than using the traditional method. And in addition, we know that um, Hubble actually jitters, meaning it actually shakes because um, it's in orbit around the Earth as um, it, the Earth orbits the Sun, but um, it orbits um, once every 90 minutes. And what that means is that it's constantly going into um, day and night every 90 minutes. And so the telescope is going through these heating, cooling cycles, depending on whether it's, um, the Sun is shining on it or not. And so um, the entire telescope flexes and changes as parts of it expand and compress over time. And this causes slight jitter or slight vibrations. And so um, these vibrations are actually correlated. So each of these um, scans is a different star. And so here you see um, the spike here, and here's another spike. Those are um, two um, different jitters or vibrations. And so we can, the fact that we see them in all the um, different stars that we are observing tells us, you yeah, know, this is something that we, we can um, identify and um, leave out of our analysis. But um, the, the jitter is um, completely correlated, and the, um, because we um, are adding up the results of lots of different stars um, or lots of different star scans, the final um, sample that we're looking at can give us a much higher signal to noise than um, previous methods. And so here are um, some um, parallax measurements of um, distant um, Cepheid variables, and so this, these are um, the, these greenish blue lines are the, the model um, changes in the, um, in the parallax due to the Earth's motion. And these little um, points here with the error bars are what was actually observed um, from Hubble. And then here um, shows what this new method um, gives us as far as um, extending the period luminosity relationship for Cepheid variables. Um, and so the, these are all the previous results, the much older results. And then these are the new ones. And this plot over here shows um, the amount of error. So you can see that the old results had much larger errors, but the, um, the new results have much, much smaller errors. So uh, these, these are all indications that this method is very powerful. Um, and then the, all the previous uh, measurements are, were of relatively um, close Cepheids, whereas um, all the later measurements or of Cepheids much further away. So we're basically expanding that distance scale in which we can uh, bootstrap our way up to the next distance scale. All right, and, and when we do that, um, one of the things that um, this Reese um, group um, realized was that um, the, the prior work for measuring the Hubble um, constant um, still had to rely on some old data. I mean, they were actually still using photographic um, plates just because um, they didn't have all the data that they, um, they could potentially um, use um, for um, their measurements. And so um, they got rid of um, the stuff that wasn't digital, um, that wasn't acquired um, consistently. And as a result, they were able to get a whole bunch of new points that kind of filled in um, this region where the Cepheid routine um, or method kind of rules to the, um, to the regime where the supernovas are important. And so here um, are um, all the um, different galaxies um, with distances that were measured um, using Cepheids. And there are four galaxies that um, they call their anchor galaxies. And those are galaxies where they actually were able to geometrically determine the distances to Cepheids using parallaxes. And then all these other ones were sort of uh, bootstrapped off of that um, by using the, the period luminosity relation. And so um, here is um, all the um, different methods that they use. So um, these four galaxies are the ones that are the anchors um, where the Cepheids were measured um, geometrically with parallaxes. And then finally, um, we're connecting up um, the calibrated Cepheids to um, the supernova uh, measurements. And then finally, um, 
There were um, 300 new supernova that were detected, um, again, using very consistent methodologies. And so this is what they find um, for the, um, how fast the universe is expanding, the Hubble constant, 73.24 plus or minus 1.74 kilometers per second per me megaparsec, which is um, a really strange unit and don't worry about what the units mean, but it basically tells you how fast the universe is, is expanding. Now what's interesting is that there's, there's actually other ways that you can get at this number, and one of them is um, by looking at the cosmic microwave background. And the cosmic microwave background is sort of the leftover radiation from the Big Bang, and when we look at the, the fluctuations of um, the radiation and model um, those fluctuations, that can actually tell us what the, um, the Hubble constant should be at the present day. And that's just because we've observed the cosmic microwave background to an extraordinarily high degree of precision. And so uh, because um, these measurements are so pre precise, we can get um, a really accurate, um, precise number for um, the Hubble constant as well. So when we do that, we get a much lower number, 66.9 plus or minus 0.6. And when we plot the two numbers, so here is the cosmic microwave background number with its error bar. And then here is the Reese result from the SHOES um, collaboration um, and with its error bar. And you can see that there's a huge discrepancy between those two numbers. And the question is, you know, why is that? And, and that's um, sort of the work of, of this new paper, but it's also, um, this new paper is based on uh, previous work that Reese had published a couple years ago. But what they did in this um, new paper was they found new, um, seven new Cepheids that they could add to their analysis. So here are those um, pulsating stars that they discovered. And, um, and actually we, um, we saw um, versions of these um, diagrams earlier, uh, but they're a little bit clearer now. Um, so again, um, the, they basically extend the luminosity um, relationship. And the, it's still um, very mysterious as to why there's such a huge difference. I mean, this is like a 9% difference in the Hubble constant. And what's interesting is that historically, um, we've been in situations like this before, meaning um, historically we've had um, scenarios where the Hubble constant has been measured to be one value. So in the 1930s and 1950s, um, astronomers were measuring the Hubble value to be, um, Hubble constant to be over 300 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And when you um, crunch the numbers for how old the universe should be, what you find is that the age of the universe was actually um, younger than the age of the Earth based on um, dating of uh, radionuclides. Um, so that was very mysterious. You know, how can the universe be younger than the Earth? Well, it turns out that when we um, looked at the Cepheids, there were actually two different types of Cepheids and uh, two different populations. And depending on how much um, contamination they had of heavy elements. And so when they uh, fixed the, the fact that there are two different Cepheid pop, uh, populations, this problem went away. And similarly, in the 1990s, we were, um, when we were, again, measuring the Hubble constant and running our models, with um, dark matter, we were finding the age of the universe to be um, less than the age of some of the oldest star clusters um, and the oldest stars. So again, that seemed like a, a really weird problem, but once dark energy was discovered, that fixed it. And so now we have, um, in the 2010s, this new problem of the Hubble constant um, getting um, closer and closer, um, but we're measuring it to be around 73. Yeah, this um, number um, was, had a precision about plus or minus 10%. Um, these numbers back then had a precision of, you know, on the order of plus or minus 100, 200%. So we're definitely getting to better and better numbers, but uh, this is um, still very different than what we find um, when we compare two different methods to getting these numbers. And so the question is, what sort of new physics, what sort of new exciting things about the universe will we discover as a result of this weird discrepancy. Um, the basic takeaways are that the universe is expanding uh, perhaps 9%, plus or minus 2.5% faster 
than um, what we would expect based on our cosmological models. So this is a result that um, will probably not go away because uh, these people have really nailed their observations. They've made their observations better and better. And um, so far, uh, we don't think there's a problem with the way that they've been observing. Next, um, you know, why there is this discrepancy could be due to the things that we don't understand in the universe, the dark matter and the dark energy. So by um, investigating you know, abstract concepts like the expansion of the universe, um, we could um, have a better understanding of even more abstract phenomena like dark energy and dark matter. And then finally, it turns out that as new um, instruments um, and new results come online, there's a, um, a European satellite called Gaia that um, is getting better and better uh, measurements for the distances of um, stars in our galaxy. And um, Reese and his group will continue to get more Hubble Space Telescope observations. And so the idea is that um, they will be able to get down to not just 2.5% uh, precision, but 1% um, or even better. And so with that, um, they're hoping to um, see, um, to perhaps get a better handle on what is happening with dark matter or dark energy um, over the course of the history of the universe. All right, so with that, um, that's the end of my presentation. And before I jump to Q&A, um, I want to point out that um, we will have um, our next Digital Earth on the last Wednesday of March. And so um, that will be, again, uh, like tonight. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be in Rickardson or in the planetarium, but check the museum schedule if you're interested in coming to the next one. And I also want to plug two upcoming space events happening here at the museum. We have a science lounge on Mars um, that Steve Lee and I will actually uh, both be participating in. And so that's open to adults, um, 21 and up. Um, but um, we also have a special screening of a planetarium show called The Man from Nine Dimensions. And um, this particular show um, isn't something that we run regularly in our dome um, just because it's so esoteric. And I think the marketing people were worried that people would get really confused. Um, but it's about string theory. And, um, and so we'll be running it um, that night um, on April 24th. Um, but I will actually be there and I'll be hosting a Q&A with the audience and talking about string theory afterwards. So um, definitely look for these um, on our website and sign up um, and register, buy tickets for them if you are so interested. And then finally, one other uh, bit. If you were, um, we, we are recording um, this presentation tonight, so if you're interested in learning more, um, you can um, next week, um, you know, probably when, when this gets posted, you can go online and find a video of this presentation. And I'll, um, we'll also have um, web links where you can go and find more information about each of the topics that I've talked about tonight. So with that, um, I'm happy to entertain questions. And we can probably bring up the lights as well. <laughs>